Rob, who is our next guest? We have Adam Bloom on the phone. Now, Adam fits in with our theme. We've been pursuing with great interest and passion for a long period of time, Neil, the uh, the mental health uh, discussion in our community. It's uh, it's very concerning. It uh, continues to be a major issue that's underfunded, under-supported, and in a lot of cases, under-recognised, I believe. And Adam is someone who stood up above all of that, and he's put pen to paper, written a book, and uh, it's called Easy Target. We're going to learn a bit more about it. Adam, good morning, and welcome to The Pulse. Uh, thank you. It's an absolute uh, honour and a privilege to, to be here and, and share my story in the hope to just help one person. Well, let's go all the way back to the start before we get the absolute guts of the matter. Your your life that has led you to make uh, make a decision to do a little bit more than just observe. So I was uh, I had a pretty normal childhood up until the age of six. I was uh, at six years old. I was uh, diagnosed with ADHD, with many difficulties, and in 2024, it's not such a big. Uh, it's not as big as what it was 25 years ago when, when I was diagnosed. And I was ostracised straight away from when I was uh, when I was diagnosed. My teachers just called me the problem child. They would put, put me in the naughty corner. And basically I was left to fend for myself. And that has an effect. And I was laughed at by my peers. I was made fun of because I struggled with, with hell, uh, with, with my schooling. And yeah, I was, I was. It was a really hard childhood, and, and because of that early diagnosis, and I was told by my youth teacher that I would amount to nothing in life. Uh, that was his parting gift to me, and that uh, yeah, I, I would amount to uh, either I would amount to nothing, or I'd end up in jail. So that was his parting gift, and uh, basically through high school, I was bullied again, and I was told that. I'd amount to nothing again, and so severely bullied, uh, and then into the workforce. So I was I was bullied as well, and it led me to take uh, well attempt suicide in 2014. My boss uh, called me a liar, a bludger, and a thief, and uh, said that yeah, uh, that those words catastrophically broke my soul, and uh, I decided that day that I would end my life, and uh, I'd. Was a big fella, so painting a picture for the listener. I was uh, a redheaded kid with freckles, and uh, yeah, for some reason, redheads we just seem to get uh, picked on regardless. So, yeah, that's, that's essentially uh, me in my early childhood into my early ad- adolescence. As a, I'm a, uh, hello, um, Adam, it's Neil here. The other one is Rob that you'd already spoken to on the phone. Uh, I was a school teacher in a about the mid 1600s, it's a very long time since I was a school teacher. But kids that we now know as being ADHD were always thought of as just being naughty. And uh, subsequently, as we've learned a lot about ADHD, which I always get the letters out of order, uh, it, it's my understanding from from what I've heard and read is that it's really hard to concentrate on one thing, and therefore it's just easier to misbehave because you can't focus on your schoolwork or you can't focus on the book you're meant to be reading or whatever. Does that sound accurate? Absolutely, yeah. So your brain's going at a million miles an hour and you're, uh, like, you're trying to process what is, like, you're trying to process what you as the teacher is saying and you are, you just, your brain can't, you just lose focus because it's just, and things that interest you, you absolutely, you, you become obsessed with them and you become obsessed on that thing. But if, if it's not interesting, it's just like, go, it goes in one ear and out the other and just, that's <laughs> May as well just be uh, talking uh, like gibber. It's just gibberish because you just can't you just can't concentrate on it. Uh, Adam, my memories of school, which is a really, really long, long time ago, where like really bully, long time ago. bullying and picking on, and I'm sort of thinking back that ADHD wasn't even spoken about then. This is back in the in the late '60s, early '70s. But I'm thinking back now that you know a little bit more about it. It was it was probably um, a lot of my friends, colleagues, peers at school had it. But I noticed what a lot of them did too was to then. Um, pick on, on others and, and softer targets themselves. It was a way of releasing and trying to square the ledger or even up or be accepted amongst the group who were taking it out of them a bit. Um, it, it was a really toxic environment back then at a time where medically even uh, there wasn't a lot of knowledge. You're some years later, I imagine, but did, did you find yourself 
um, not necessarily picking on others, but doing other things to gain acceptance when you were being bullied? Uh, no, I can't say that I did because I, I was the I was the one that was being bullied uh, because of it. So I, I can't actually say, and from my memory, no, I I, I never. I always I knew what it felt like to bully to be big to be bullied. So I, and I wouldn't want I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So uh, no, I, I don't. I just wanted to be accepted. Like I. So I'd try to play sport or I'd, I'd try to, uh, I would try to fit in, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that at, 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 at the expense of someone else. Yep. The expense of someone else. Yep. No, I, I don't ever remember doing that. I think the other thing that I can remember about being, uh, when kids were being bullied at school, when I was at school, I'm significantly younger than Rob, you understand, not quite as young as you, but significantly younger than Rob, um, that it was physical bullying, you know, threatens, threatened that they'd punch your head in after school or they'd jam your head down the dunny and flush it or, or whatever. Uh, but it can be as subtle as leaving you out of a conversation and that sort of stuff, isn't it? I think people now are more aware. Absolutely, yeah. It, it's, or they would probably... You weren't quite... Uh, you weren't quite the you weren't quite the the, the most the, the most gifted at sport, or you'd be the last one selected to to play at lunch, or uh, you, you wouldn't be selected, and it, yeah, absolutely, you, you were felt to be that you were ostracised, and 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 I did, I absolutely did, and I and I would blame it on my ADHD. I go. Oh, but, you know, I can't even can't even make friends. I, I you know, I struggle to socially interact uh, with with peers, and and yeah, absolutely. Uh, Adam, they're interesting that the medicos knew enough to to diagnose you, but what what support did they provide as well at the time? Uh, so I was very <coughs> lucky that uh, I had uh, an amazing specialist who he was. His pain was absolutely made, and my parents. I've got to thank my parents because my parents um, they they gave me the like they gave me a chance in life when so many others um, told my parents to not medicate us, and uh, my parents were judged big. Uh, um, they were judged um, terribly by family, by friends that all had an opinion, and Mum and Dad just said no. We're 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 doing this our way. We we need to um we need to support our um we need to support our um like we need to support our kids because my brother also um has uh ADD as well. So um both my and my parents just said that we are we are going to help both our kids because it's our our duty and and uh the specialist was amazing. He he just uh, his team uh, just just made always made us feel that we were we weren't different and so the school in primary school I didn't really have much help uh, in regards to uh, support but that changed in high school I, I had a, a, a support network of teach of uh, peer support teachers that helped during high school uh, but in those early years there wasn't a lot of support and yeah, my, I I have to give credit to my parents because they stuck to their guns and they didn't listen. And I am who I am today because of my parents. So wind the clock back five, uh, ten years, and we um, we we find you at the ultimate low point. It doesn't get any lower than you were ten years ago. Here you are, ten years later. You're an author. Um, what was the turning point that enabled you to get to a point where you can put your thoughts into a book? And, and sort of get it out there as a message. Uh, so, yeah, as, as I say, yeah, I was I was already at a low point uh, leading up to that fateful day in September in 2014. And we talk in the mental health space, as you guys know, is that you have a you have a mental fog, and I had that mental fog. I was uh, I was struggling. I was already uh, my self esteem was virtually non-existent, and just those those words from my boss just hit me over the edge. Those those three words, calling me a liar, a bludger, and a thief, just catastrophically broke my soul. And and that mental fog lifted that day. It was it 
it was that day that I said, well, if he thinks that, the whole world thinks that, so I'm going to end my life. And I, I still remember that day it, it, as clear as, as it, it's as clear as day of what what happened that afternoon and then the journey, the process started uh, after that fateful afternoon of uh, that I needed help and that the, it had got too big. Uh, the problem had got too big for me to, to work on my own and I, I started surrounding myself with... Uh, so I, I say to anyone who is struggling is, is finding the right psychologist is or psychiatrist or counsellor is like speed dating. You have to... It's some that you go and go, well, we might go on a coffee date. Actually, no, you're not for me. Uh, then you see others and you go, well, actually, you might be... We might go on a coffee date. And when I found my psychologist, uh, he, we started working through my my childhood trauma, my ad- my adolescence trauma, and he just said to me, "You need to lose weight because at that stage I'd grown out to 166 kilos, and I've lost 66 kilos in uh, the last five years." And I started surrounding myself with a like uh, uh, just inspirational people that only wanted to see me succeed and. My mentor, uh, Janine Garner, said to me that uh, you need to write your story. You, this needs to become a book. And I said, basically I told her to F off because I said, I can't write a book because of my ADHD and my learning difficulties. I said, I barely passed year 12 English. How can I write a book? There is just no way that I can write a book. And she said, no, you can and you will do this. And that started a, a three-year journey in 2021 that, uh, yeah, got the book published uh, in March this year. And uh, it's been a, a very uh, wild, crazy ride. But, uh, yeah, writing a book is, is no, it's like, it's like getting to the summit of Mount Everest. And, to uh, yeah, if I, had a, if I look back on the section 10 years ago to where I am now, uh, what would I say to Adam? I'd say to Adam on the cliff that day, I'd say strap yourself in for a wild ride, a wild, a, a ride of you're going to learn so much uh, about yourself and there's going to be a lot of self-discovery, a lot of pain, uh, a lot of suffering, but uh, you, you'll come out a better version of yourself and now I know why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to help as many people as I can and knock uh those numbers off the, uh, the statistics off the wall and try and help as many people as I can. So when you set out to write the book, what percentage was to help you get your mind around it and how much, what percent was to help others like you that are in that situation? Uh, I think at first it, it, it was, it started as really a cathartic process for myself and then uh, I decided well, as I was writing my story, I, I went, well, I'm writing this to help uh, others, and, and that's, that's what it was. It was, purely, and it was purely written just to help one person, and on my book launch night that I had in March, I, a complete stranger who I didn't know uh, got up out of the audience and actually said, you've saved my life, and, and she said, where you were 10 years ago is where I am right now, and uh, there is hope, and for me, that that's that was the the greatest gift of, of all. And and I think for me, that's why I wrote the book was just simply to help one person. And and I I might never know that who who it inspires, but uh, it was just written to help one person, and I've I've achieved that. So that that for me, uh, and she got in contact with me after she finished reading the book, and her son was struggling as well, and uh, she. She rang me uh, just last week and said, uh, thank you uh, for what you've done with your story, Adam. We are now both going to go and get help. So, uh, And that was plain and simply, that's what it was for. It was to help just, just one person and I've helped two. So um, that's that's it. That's what it is. And I sense a lot more that haven't come forward either, uh, Adam. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, And that's that's exactly right. I, I think that there are, there are people that, May, may never come forward, and that's fine. That's you know, it's just lovely to receive messages uh, from people that that it is helping, and and they can resonate with the book. And obviously, as well, you've got your, your negative uh, responses as well. But that's just part of life. And and I don't uh, I don't listen to the to the naysayers because if I listened to the naysayers, I never would have uh, written the book, and I never would have uh, I never would have started my podcast. But uh, 
that I do as well. So, uh, yeah, anyone out there who's listening to this, don't let naysayers stop you from... If you've got a dream and a goal, uh, go and pursue that and, and make them uh, um, become a reality. He slipped in the podcast very nicely there too. Very, well, very done. well done. So the name of the book is Easy Target. Uh, I'm assuming the podcast is called Easy Target as well, is it? Uh, no, it's actually called uh, True Blue Conversation. So okay. I interview uh, veterans, uh, first responders, being being a first responder myself, and uh, also inspirational people. So uh, yeah, you can you can get that on all major um, platforms to listen to veterans and first responders and hear their stories of service and and transition, and also inspirational people who have got. Uh, story similar to mine, so uh, yeah, that's that's, that's what it's. Uh, that's my podcast and and the book. Yeah, as you mentioned, is easy target and it's available in, in all good bookstores. And if it's anything like the stuff that I used to write once upon a time, it's also available in very bad bookstores as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adam Bloom, thanks so much for sharing your message. For those who are listening to this who may have been triggered by something that Adam has said, uh, of course, you can call Lifeline on 13 11 14 if it's an emergency. If it's less of an emergency, you just want to reach out and find some assistance. Beyond Blue, of course, uh, do a wonderful job. You can contact them, 1300 224636. That's 1300 224636, Lifeline 13 11 14. Uh, Adam, thanks for joining us on the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show. Um, hopefully someone out there has been listening and you've helped them this morning as well. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come on and speak. And I'll just say this to the, the listeners as well, that it's it's not weak to speak. Speaking up takes courage, and speaking up can save your life. And it saved my life, and it can save yours too, and, and you're never alone. So... Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Good on you, mate. Thanks, Best wishes. Good really work. appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, mate. Adam Bloom there, B-L-U-M, if you're trying to find it. And uh, True Blue Conversations, the podcast, and Easy Target is the book.